Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the nice presentation and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me for this uh, lecture and, and conference. Mahdud Ganim in Donahuat, Ririnka Evar Pinted Wat, and with my Piwa Kurash, the Lahatut, Wahanen Pass. If you come with me to the woods, you will need to drink a pint of blood to give you the courage to kill the people on the highway. <laughs> These lines open a version of a well known Breton ballad about Maharit Charles, the female leader of a gang of bandits operating in Tregor, so in the northwest coast of Brittany in the 16th century. It's one of the thousands of versions corresponding to hundreds of different ballad types known as uh, squares for the singular, recorded from our tradition from the 19th century to the present day, the most important collections having been uh, having been recorded between the 1840s and the 1980s. These squares you form a specific literary genre in Breton, so to Celtic language I know you all know this here if you are Irish, but I know also there are people coming from everywhere in the world, so if you're not sure to know where Brittany is, it's here. <laughs> so not a very good map of uh, uh, linguistic areas for Celtic languages on the left, and on the right you have this division between Lower Brittany, the historical uh, uh, area where Breton was spoken in the west of Brittany and Higher Brittany with more a French cultural and linguistic heritage. So these squares you saw are songs in Breton and they can be defined as a follow. They are tragic ballads about local historical events often linked with murders rapes, infanticides, and other pathetic death. Many, many things for the end of the afternoon. So there are very long songs, often several dozens of stanzas, up to 80 stanzas of two or four lines. So the interpretation of a single ballad can easily last 15 or 20 minutes or more. There are oral ballads, which were not printed on broadsheets, they were not even written on manuscripts for what we know, which doesn't mean that there was no influence of written text, of course, but they were massively transmitted by oral communication for several centuries. So the context, the background is very different from uh, the background of other uh, close uh, linguistic areas, including French, English, and Irish, I think. So they tell a story that were considered as true historical facts by the singers who performed or listened to them. And this is a very important part of the definition of this song, true stories. And in order to prove that these stories relate true, uh, uh, these songs relate true stories, they provide names of places and people often preserved with great precision during the oral transmission. So we often know the first and last names of murderers and victims, the precise village where the event took place, and the song also gives a lot of details concerning material culture, social attitudes, religious beliefs, and so on. And all these precisions invite to compare the songs and other historical archives, and the comparisons with trials, parochial registers, last wills, chronicles, and other sources show that the stories very often related, the stories related in the Grezu are often really true local historical events that took place between the 16th and the 18th centuries. Grezu have often been compared to gazettes spreading local news at a time where there was no newspapers and where many inhabitants in the countryside could not read. But in the same time, the genre of the also has a significant literary dimension. These ballads hold in tension two sometimes contradictory elements. The desire to report crimes and historical events faithfully in the local context 
and in the same time the need for the ballads to conform to an established poetic genre with expected motifs and stereotypes. We don't have precise information about the composers of the songs, but consistent indications suggest that they were composed quickly after the events they depict, and they circulated for several generations of centuries before being collected with multiple textual and musical variations, massively from poor people, mainly beggars and small craftsmen in the countryside. So they are clearly not compositions written in the 19th century by authors inspired by romantic ideas. So now we have these definitions in mind, we can analyze the place given to bandits and outlaws in Guazio and what these representations reveal on both historical events and the mechanisms of social memory in Breton society throughout the centuries. So I'd like to start with four uh, general uh, observations. The first observation is that the number of ballads related to bandits and outlaws is limited. In fact, this number depends on how we define what a bandit is. It's quite an unclear concept. Uh, but some of these ballads about the bandits uh, are among the most often recorded and they are known through dozens of different versions in oral tradition. So not so many ballad types, but many versions. The second observation is that the figure of a social bandit, as analyzed by Hobsbawm and discussed by many scholars after him, is not really represented. There is no Robin Hood in Breton ballads. No, nobody robbing the rich to give to the poor. And the songs focus more on the darker figure of bandits, leaders of gangs of thieves and criminals who actually lived in Brittany between the 16th and the 18th centuries. The third observation is that Guazio mainly focus on the death of bandits more than on their actions during their lives. And it has consequences on the treatment and atmosphere of these songs. And the last observation is that the discourse on these historical figures differs greatly depending on whether one considers the songs or other written and sometimes oral sources preserved about their lives. So the trend clearly is towards a form of heroization in the Guarazio, whereas the same characters are considered negatively in written sources. So I propose to develop these observations with the analysis of four figures of bandits corresponding to historical characters between the end of the 16th century and the French Revolution. Each case study allowing to develop different aspects of the relation between history and social memory in oral tradition. And my first case is Fontanella. <coughs> the first was so about this leader of the band of soldiers at the end of the 16th century. The, the second part of the 16th century was a period of political and religious conflict in France, not only in France, and also in Brittany in the context of the wars of religion, especially during the last decade of the 16th century, during what we call the War of the League between 1589 and 1598, so after the death of the last son of King Henry II and Catherine of Medici, the legitimate successor of the Kingdom of France became Henry IV, King of Navarre, a major figure of a Protestant party. And a bloody civil war ensued between, on one hand, royalists who affirmed that kingship is more important than religion and who supported Henry IV, and on the other hand, ultra-Catholics belonging to the party of the League, who affirmed that religion is more important than kingship and were refused to be ruled by a king who had strong connections with Protestantism, although he had converted to Catholicism to ascend the throne of France. In Brittany, the civil war was really traumatic. A lot of gangs, often led by noblemen, either ultra-Catholics or royalists, perpetrated numerous crimes, ransacks, rapes, murders. And we possess different kinds of written archives which relate to the civil war, especially memoirs written by ecclesiastics, and we also possess a very rich repertoire of songs of Guarzio. More than 
90 different versions of Breton songs clearly connected with the War of the League and corresponding to six different ballad types, known only from oral traditions. There is no written text before the first notations made by ethnographers in the 19th century. It's quite a lot, I think, if we keep in mind that these songs have been transmitted for what we know over four centuries. One of the most significant of these ballads is the words about Fontanella, so the Breton name of Guy Eder de la Fontenelle in French, a Breton nobleman belonging to the party of the League, whose troops were guilty of countless massacres and ransacks in Brittany. We know two ballad types concerning this character, corresponding to about 30 versions collected in the Trégor area for most of them, but also in other parts of Western Brittany. Here you have a map of the different versions collected from our tradition, so the Trégor area is this part of Brittany in the north. So Fontanella is also mentioned in a more anecdotal way in several other Breton ballads. And I propose first to listen to a short extract from a version recorded by Ifik Troadec here, one of the major collectors of Breton folk songs in the recent years. We collected this version in 1978 in Mini Tregui in from uh, Yvonne Détente, an old woman who learned her rich repertoire from her mother, Jeanne Yvonne Garland. I'm going to talk about the different uh, Breton dialect during my talk. So Tregor is here, and later we're going to talk about Cornwall and, and Vantin. noble heiress called Marie Le Chevoir, how he profanated a church and transformed it into a stable, and finally how he was arrested, judged and beheaded. And we can find traces of all these events in several written sources contemporaneous with the War of the League. All the versions of these ballads depict Fontanella in a positive manner. He is a good-hearted man, whose only crime is the abduction of a girl that he marries honorably after having sent her to, uh, to a convent, a fact which is attested in written documents, before being arrested and condemned to death. By contrast, all the written sources we possess, memoirs and chronicles, present a very negative portrait of this nobleman. And interestingly, the same negative opinion appears in the numerous legends, comments, and anecdotes which were collected from oral tradition about Fontanella in the 19th and 20th centuries. For example, the English traveller Adolphus Trollope, when travelling through Brittany in 1839, was surprised by the number of horrible stories he heard about Fontanella and he reports several of them in his travel diary published under the title A Summer in Brittany. So he writes, there is no part of Brittany in which traditionary tales of cruelties and abominations of this terrible chieftain are not still rife. Though he remain in position of Corlais, it's a small village in the center of Brittany, little more than two years, the peasants still tell stories of his ravaging the country, burning the houses, carrying off the young girls, etc. Other testimonies show that his name was used as an insult 
you are worse than Fontanella, or you are one of Fontanella's kinds. And his name was given to scarecrows to frighten disobedient children, <laughs> at least until the beginning of the 20th century. For example, Pierre Jacques Elias, in his very documented book, The Horse of Pride, Le Cheval d'Orgueil in French, about his life story as a child in Pays Bigoudin, so in the southwestern part of Brittany, in the first year of the 20th century, wrote that the fact to compare someone to Fontanella was an insult serious enough to take someone to court. So, how can we understand this striking difference of treatment between the point of view developed on these bandits in Guerzio and in all the other written and oral sources? Two hypotheses here. First one, the question of author. Can we attribute this positive vision of Fontanella in the ballad to the subjectivity of the ballad authors who could have been their companions or sympathizers? We have no information to support this hypothesis, although it's an established fact that certain songs were composed and diffused in order to heroicize characters for political ends, and it's, it's especially uh, at, uh, documented for the French Revolution. Another question is about uh, the aesthetic canons corresponding to the ballad as a genre. And we must look particularly at the ends of these ballads, which are, which are the most flexible parts in the songs. All the words you about Fontanella focus on the characters edifying death on the scaffold. The inhabitants who see his executions are praying and crying until his decapitation. The song says that his head is put on a plate and the lock of his hair is sent to the inhabitants of his native parish in remembrance of him. This end is not unique to the words of Fontanella, and we find more or less the same verses ending another ballad about another Breton bandit and outlaw, the Marquis of Pontcalais, which is my second example. The ballad about the death of the Marquis of Pontcalais is one of the most famous words. It relates an important historical event in Brittany. Chrysogone Clément de Guerre, Marquis de Pontcalec, for his French name, had, with a few other Breton noblemen, organized a conspiracy against Philip II, who was appointed regent of the French kingdom during the minority of Louis XV. He became an outlaw, he was arrested and condemned to be beheaded in 1720. We can remark that whereas you concern basically local events, as I said earlier, and it's unusual to find connections with national history, but it's the case with this song about Poncalek's death. The success of this verse is linked to its publication in the second edition of Theodore Hersard de la Ville Marquet's well-known anthology entitled Bars Brace in 1945. The version caused a great stir. On one hand, La Ville Marquet was accused of having rewritten the song, giving it an anti-French and anti-bourgeois orientation, which is not part of tradition. On the other hand, this description of Pancalek's death was interpreted in a romantic way as a tragic rebellion of Brittany against France. This vision explains the ballad's success up to the present day in certain militant circles. Nearly all the most famous Breton singers and musicians sang this song during the 1960s and 70s folk singer, and its success continues today. And during the same time, a lot of historians made use of the ballad in their interpretations of Breton history under the French Ancien Regime, French Early Modern Period. <coughs> Attention has been paid mostly to one version of a song, one text, one music, the one published in the Bars Esprits. However, a lot of other versions have been collected from oral tradition from the 19th century up to the end of the 20th century, mainly in the lower area, uh, lower Plante area, this part. Close to the village where the Marquis of Pancalec lived and was arrested. A few other were collected in other places like here in Trégor. So let's listen to a short extract 
from a version performed by Véronique Brousseau on the right uh, here. And Véronique Brousseau was recorded first by Claudine Mazéas at the end of the 1950s and a few years later by Donatien Laurent on the right. And she was born in Kernas a village adjacent to Pontcalex native parish. Her version is relatively recent, but it's the longest which has ever been collected with 49 stanzas and it lasts 16 minutes, so it will be only a short extract. <laughs> She comments first. disguises himself as a peasant to escape from soldiers looking for him. He is hidden by a priest, but he is denounced by a beggar and arrested. He is sent to the city of Nantes to be judged and beheaded. His wife, as soon as she hears the news, tries to save him, but she arrives too late and the Marquis is already dead. We have no uh, representation of the Marquis of Poncalé, contemporaneous representation, but it, it inspired a lot of uh, 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 um, artists after that. So we will see a few representations of later artists like this one. All versions are based on the same frame, but the Marquis' physical and psychological traits, the reasons for his condemnation, the location of the story and the choice and details of the events between his arrest and his death differ according to the different versions. The scenes related in the songs are a mix of historical facts attested in written sources and made up events. For example, the stories at Poncalec disguised in peasant clothing took refuge in a presbytery where he was arrested by royal troops before being judged and executed is consistent with the written records, especially the records of his trial. But the motive of a treachery by a beggar, which is a central theme in the ballad, is an innovation. And it's the same thing for his wife's attempt to save him and actually was not married. <laughs> So, certain versions we know propose a negative judgment on Pankalek. Uh, he is presented as a cruel man who had killed and so deserved his sentence. This representation is close to the portrayal of the Marquis as it appears in written sources, especially in the testimony of many different witnesses interviewed during his trial, and they all evoke a violent and irritable man, a smuggler who terrorized his peasants, as well as other noblemen and justice officers. But the other versions of the song depict him in a very positive manner. He is the best man on earth, the great friend of Breton people, a pious and brave man who had committed no crime, but had tried to defend his country and was unjustly condemned by bad judges. When he is arrested, Punkalek says long and heart-trending goodbyes to his country. Even the soldiers who arrest him are in tears, 
inhabitants of Nantes, so the city where he was publicly executed, are praying, crying, and shouting that it's a sin to kill the Marquis. And the last stanza describes Poncalek's head lying on the paving stones and used as a game by children. His head is put on a plate and the lock of his hair is sent to the inhabitants of his native parish in remembrance of him. It's exactly the same verses as for Fontanella. So, with Fontanella and Poncalek, we have two well-known historical figures often considered as bandits and dangerous criminals in Britain and even in some oral sources, either contemporaneous with the lives and death or recorded much later in the oral memory of various Breton communities. And these same characters are perceived positively in Breton ballads focusing on their death on the scaffold. In fact, their repentant and pathetic death absolves all crimes. It corresponds to a well-known cliché developed in several Guerzio, in which bandits and criminals are transformed into heroes because they die. It also corresponds perfectly to the requirement of a tragic genre of Guerz, and we find it in several other literary genres in Brittany and beyond the borders of Brittany. In both cases, the oral memory transmitted a very selective portrait of two noblemen and bandits. Their lives, and especially their death, were compatible with the poetic requirements of Guerzio, and so it facilitated their adaptation in oral tradition. As Peter Burke has shown, it's easier to adapt a life story to pre-existing cliché than to create new stereotypes, and in such a scheme, being executed is a good starting point to become a hero in Breton Ballad because this genre mainly focuses on tragic death. So the use of stereotypes allows the integration or facilitates the integration of certain characters into the Breton oral tradition. But at the same time, it has for consequence that a part of the historical events are transformed to be adapted to the aesthetic canons of a Breton Ballad. So using stereotypes facilitates the emergence of partially depersonalized heroes <coughs> whose stories are partly interchangeable. So we are faced with this permanent tension in Guerzio between the desire to relate historical event faithfully, which makes the identity of Guerzio, and the necessity to conform to expected poetic motives. My third example now is uh, Maharit Charles. It brings us back to the War of the League at the end of, this, of the 16th century with a less often recorded grace that I mentioned in the first quotation of my presentation at the very beginning of this lecture. The Guerres about Maharit Charles, nicknamed Archarlesen, the female leader of a gang of bandits who was based in a forest near the Channel Coast. Several versions of the song were written down by ethnographers in the 19th century in different locations in the north of Brittany mainly, but it was never a sound recorded during 20th century fieldwork surveys. So we ex the extract we are going to listen to now is a reinterpretation of a version written down by a major Breton folklorist, François-Marie Luzel, a version he recorded in 1874 and it's sung by a singer from Trégor, Eugénie Parcheminard. Mae o mon war charlesen, a huit a levat bwys e fen, on a e ked ar ze blan ba, cleved ar charlesen huit a la. Notre cœur a glas a la ri, Des pages pillons en déroué, et on s'est oublié quand m'en soudé, quand d'un clair fait à Charlesen. Ragma on clair à Charlesen, et son mar au prêt m'en soudé, ou à qui l'ir par la farine, à Charlesen n'a sauté quoi. Okay, so this ballad tells the story of the exactions of Maharit Charles and his men who kill the people who cross the forest of Quadondresen. She kills her own father, 
whom she later recognizes thanks to his hat. <laughs> the Lord of Kiranglas finally stops her by making her believe that he needs her as a godmother for the baptism of a child. When she climbs on the scaffold to be executed, she reveals the place where she has hidden the body of a child she gave birth to and she killed, as well as the bodies of the pregnant women she killed. Unlike Fontanella and Punkalek, there are very few historical sources available to document Maharit Shale's life. No portrait of her, once again only later artists painted her. But the song can be replaced in a rich set of oral traditions related to bandits always presented as bloodthirsty murderers. In particular, the Ranu brothers, who are the main characters of another ballad type. The Ranu brothers are presented as the disciples of Maharit Charles, and they kill merchants passing on the highway. The first verse of a version collected by Luzel is very explicit. Maharit Charles plach an en bras, dus maget ar voler in bras, i dus maget potre dran ou gwasa voler in zo ervo. Maharit Charles, the woman on the highway, has fed the great thieves. She fed the sons of Ram, the wickedest thieves in the country. Maharit Charles can also be compared to another female leader of a gang of bandits in Cornwall, in the southwestern part of Brittany, in the 18th century, who is this time very well documented by the written archives, in particular uh, judicial archives, Marion Dufawet, Marion Arfawet. And for this Marion Arfawet, some fragments of songs have also been collected, but much less than for Maharit Charles. And the lives and types of actions of these two women have many similarities. But more than songs, legends associated with both of them have been collected from oral tradition, sometimes related to specific places and landscapes. And if we listen to the different versions of a song carefully, Maharit Charles is the subject of ambivalent representations. She is presented both as a hurtless criminal whose murder generate horror and fear and are condemned without hesitation, infanticide, parasite. But she also has a disturbing human and maternal dimension when she agrees to surrender to the enemy, to be the godmother of a newborn child. And the way she is arrested treacherously inspires a form of sympathy for her. In this course, like in many others, there is an ambiguity between women who are both guilty of crimes and victims of crimes. Above all, Maharit Charles represents a model of female power, a model of female domination over men and freedom that contradicts the expected social codes in early modern and modern Breton society, but which corresponds to other heroic female figures in the Guerzu, such as Honor Guardian, a peasant girl who fights against the nobleman who wants to rape her sister. The men have swords and she has only a stick, but she kills all of them and the king grants her a pardon. Such fantasized stories, there is no trace of Honor Guardian's heroic actions in the written archives, but such fantasized stories raise questions about the perception of these whereas you on powerful women for the performers and their audiences, especially when they are also women. The versions of Maharit Charles and Honor Guardian published by Luzel were interpreted by women. Although other versions have also been collected from men, but much less, less often. And it's also a woman who sings the version of Maharit Charles collected by another collector at the beginning of the 20th century, Maurice Duhamel, on which the Breton singer and researcher Marthe Vassalo has written a very interesting study to understand the meaning of this song for the performer Marie-Vonne Le Flem. It's this book entitled Les Chants du Livre Bleu, on this figure of Marie-Vonne Le Flem, this Breton singer at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And the author, Marthe Vassalo, the researcher, tries to 
uh, see how this woman chose her repertoire of songs and what, he, what echoes can have the ballads she sings with her personal life and her situation <coughs> as a woman. And I think that this approach is in line with recent very interesting works about female voices in oral tradition by historians such as uh, David Hopkins on the oral repertoire of lace makers in 19th century France, or Alison Posca, who questions the perception of legends about rebel women among Galician female communities in the early modern period. My last example is linked to the others. Maharit, Charles, and Poncalek have a common characteristic. Several versions of these Guazio propose a story which is relocated in the context of the French Revolution. The French Revolution was a traumatic episode of civil war between those in favor of a new regime and the counter-revolutionaries, often called Chouan, who wanted to restore the power of the king and the Catholic Church. Here is a, a famous painting, well, famous in Brittany, <laughs> uh, uh, representing a, a Chouan peasant arrested by Republican soldiers in the south of Brittany. Um, so historically, uh, uh, these are errors or reinterpretation of the history in social memories, so reinterpretation like this one, so relocating a song in a later context, either conscious or not, but I think these kinds of reinterpretation are especially valuable because they reveal a lot of things about the situation and aspirations of the communities in which these traditions are still performed several centuries after the initial context of composition of these uh, songs. For what concerns Guazio, we can observe a phenomenon of Shuanization of oral tradition. A Shuan background, so a counter-revolutionary background, has been added to older songs. Shuan have found such an important place in oral memory that they absorb and appropriate older events which are linked to them in song, especially in areas deeply marked by the counter-revolutionary insurrections such as the Vante area in the south of uh, Brittany. So if we take example related to our former uh, bandits, in the ballad about Maharit Charles, a version mentions Republican soldiers instead of noblemen arrested her. In the context of the 16th century, it makes no sense at all to have Republican soldiers, of course. And for what concerns the Marquis of Poncalek, several versions of a ballad renovate the story, so the initial story was in 1720, by placing it within the context of a revolution. The Marquis is arrested no more by dragons, so cavalry men under the reign of Louis XIV, Louis XV, but by Chouan. In Breton, dragonnet, chouanet. You have the same number of syllables, the same rhyme, so it's very easy to change one word. And changing one word allows, is enough, to give a new historical sense to the song. In another version, the Marquis is beheaded with a guillotine, which makes no sense before the French Revolution. A variant shows a mixture between this ballad about the death of Poncalec and the song about the death of Jean Jean, a Chouan leader who was killed in 1798, just a few miles away from the place where the Marquis of Poncalec was arrested eight years before. So there is a partial <coughs> confusion between the two stories and characters in the same geographical area. This ballad about Jean Jean has much in common with Poncalec and Fontanella. Chouan were doing guerrilla actions, hidden in the nature, killing Republican soldiers, and they were considered as dangerous bandits by the authorities. Several ballads focus on their actions and mostly their heroic death, 
like in the case of Jean Jean and his companion Claude Lorcy, nicknamed L'Invincible. The last verses of the song about Jean Jean say that their bones were kept in a chapel and used as relics, and women rub their rosaries against them to gain protection. Beyond songs, a lot of legends and stories associated with Chouan and related to specific landscapes, graves, houses still visible can be heard until today, partly influenced by the revitalization of these historical events by the clergy in the 19th century, but also for some of them deeply rooted in a long-standing oral tradition spread in and transmitted in families. At the end of the 19th century, this oral tradition of legends and songs was re-energized by the local clergy. A priest rediscovered and highlighted the bones of attributed to Jean Jean's companion. You can see them here. And he wrote a short biography of this Chouan published in a local historical society's uh, journal. And the bones were exhibited in a small chapel. And uh, a few years later, the, 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 the picture was taken in 1966. That's a long time after the French Revolution. <laughs> and a few years later, another priest published a second version of a ballad together with long explanations in favor <coughs> of the Chouan side. During the first years of the 20th century, a period when the power of the church was strongly challenged by the government of the Third Republic in, in, in France, the beginning of laicity, uh, the, reactivated, the reactivated memory of Jean Jean was interpreted by some people as a heroic sacrifice for the preservation of the Catholic faith. By contrast, two generations later, socialist supporters used to public publicly sing the same words as well as other <coughs> ballads about the counter revolution to mock Chouan, associated with the right wing party. And to mock Chouan, they, 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 they sung these songs reminding their death and so their defeats. In some villages, until the 1970s, socialists and conservatives confronted each other during electoral campaigns by singing pro or anti Chouan songs, although the events had happened nearly two centuries before. And I think we can draw parallels between these situations and David Hopkins' comment on the process of folkloric ecotype uh, developed uh, first by Carl von Sido in Carl von Sido's pioneering works. And David Hopkins writes that the process of ecotypification, the way that a cultural artifact becomes adapted to a specific milieu, not only reveals the cultural preferences of a group, but also connects those preferences to particular experiences. And I think it's really true with songs related to the French Revolution and to the Chouan, with very different experiences and political oppositions within local communities, within families, which created different social memories, different folk historiographies, if we refer to Guy Biner's analytical framework, and a diversity of textual variants in ballads. So I propose to listen to an extract of uh, this song about Jean Jean, sung by Joachim Le Clinch. He was one of these socialist supporters singing the song uh, uh, about the death of Jean Jean to, to, to against the Chouan. And it was recorded by Loïse Le Bras in the 1960s in Beau, so in the, in the Vente area. Thank <laughs> you. 
Material usually analyzed to document early modern and modern Brittany. Their use requires to shift chronological boundaries and to go beyond fact finding in order to understand the construction of social memories over the long term. And I'd like to leave a final word to Alessandro Portelli, mm -hmm. who observed after his field work on the oral history of working class movements in Italy and the United States, so nothing to do with early modern bandits. But he says that by including error, imagination, and desire, oral sources reveal not only the history of what happened, but the history of what it meant. And I think that this quotation perfectly applied to Breton ballads on bandits and outlaws. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 